a major signal from Washington of help for sick ground zero workers. But even if this offer comes through, the benefits battle is far from a fair fight. A prostitution ring broken up in the suburbs, the dark and quiet home police say was transformed into a brothel, and a call for change, a new twist in the fight over cell phones in city schools. Live from Studio 6B in Rockefeller Center, this is New York Nightly News with Chuck Scarborough. Good evening. On the eve of the sixth anniversary of the September terror attacks, when so many died so suddenly, so violently, the movement to help those who still suffer has gained a powerful new ally. At City Hall today, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi stood beside Mayor Bloomberg and declared that she would support the reopening of the September 11th Victims' Compensation Fund. That federal fund expired nearly four years ago. But since then, thousands who worked in the swirling dust and the toxic air of lower Manhattan say they've developed cancers and coughs and other conditions that threaten their health and livelihoods. The situation that they are in now challenges the conscience of our country. They acted in good faith. They acted uh, in good conscience. I don't think we have met that challenge. How do you down the road assure that when people have a, more of a distance between then and the terrible event of 9-11, we still meet our obligations? Now, the compensation battle has left thousands of ground zero workers feeling like second class citizens, especially those who have no outside pensions or financial safety nets. Case in point, the couple you're about to meet left struggling because of a cruel quirk of the calendar. Government Affairs reporter Melissa Russo has their story. Tomorrow, September 11th, will not be the joyous occasion Donna Nolan once imagined as a young bride. It will be my 20th wedding anniversary. But. It's not, it doesn't have the same meaning. Donna and her husband Jimmy are still in love and raising four sons. But when tragedy struck six anniversaries ago, Jimmy, an experienced carpenter and steel cutter, raced to the Trade Center to begin more than two years of recovery and rebuilding. Burning steel, recovering bodies. He says his work made him proud and sick. I was never sick in my life. Today, at age 42, Jimmy says his lungs are badly scarred and constantly infected. He takes 10 medications, and specialists still don't understand his mysterious blisters. He says he feels too winded to coach his kids' baseball, and it's getting harder to work. I don't know if I'm going to be here next year. That's the way how I look at it. I'm 42 years old, and I shouldn't be thinking... that I'm going to be a widow. That's not fair. That's not what my life is supposed to be. Jimmy has medical coverage, but his co-payments for specialists are growing as quickly as his own so fear of left. death as he no, watches dozens of fellow tradesmen, big brawny guys, wither. It's hard, especially guys I worked with side by side on lung transplants. And I just, we just buried one of the guys in my local and, uh, his wife and kids, who's going to feed them? I want to know who's going to pay my mortgage and, and feed my kids if I pass away next month or, or next year. That's the question. And the harsh answer right now is no one. The truth is, not all 9-11 heroes are created equal. Unlike police and firefighters whose line of duty injuries come with disability pensions and death benefits for widows and children, construction workers don't have those benefits. He was praised up and down and he was called a hero. But now that he's sick and we need that help, he's just a building tradesman. Six years after the fact, people suffering with trade center illnesses say the benefits are still as random as the fate of who would live and die that day. Some get help, some don't. Some with health insurance pay more for care than uninsured workers or even undocumented immigrants who get free treatment from the city. Some people got big lump sum payments years ago for a cough, while others today get nothing for life-threatening illnesses. On September 11th, both Yvonne Sanchez and Marvin Bethay were EMTs. Both rushed to the scene, both rescued people, both got sick, both had to quit. 
But because Yvonne worked for the city, she's collecting a disability pension and workers' compensation, earning as much as when she worked and sending her children to college. If it wasn't for this job, I think we'd be living on welfare. Because Marvin worked in a St. John's Hospital ambulance dispatched by the city, but not technically a city ambulance, he's collecting workers' compensation for a fraction of what he used to earn. $400 a week, when in fact I was making close to $95,000 a year. In a nutshell, after 9-11, Congress gave the city a billion-dollar insurance fund to pay claims against the city. While millions have been spent to defend against claims and lawsuits, not a penny of that money has been spent to compensate a sick person. Insurance companies pay valid claims. These are 10,000 workers who were sick because of the violation of the labor law of the state of New York, not given a safe place to work. But the mayor argues that the way this insurance fund was set up, he can't just start writing out checks. He says he's obligated to preserve that billion dollars in case people develop even more serious illnesses 10 or 20 years down the road. The alternative, which is what Speaker Pelosi endorsed this morning, is to take that billion dollars and instead use it as a down payment for another victim's compensation fund. And why would that compensation fund be preferable to an insurance fund? Well, the process wouldn't be as adversarial. For someone like Jimmy Nolan, the construction worker, in order to collect money, he would just have to make the case meeting some basic criteria that he could have gotten sick from September 11th. He wouldn't have to prove that it was the city's fault that he got sick. And as part of this deal, Mayor Bloomberg wants Congress to cap the city's liability. And how many workers are actually suing the city over this? Uh, we're told by David Warby, the lawyer that you just heard from, that the number's up to 10,000 clients. That's up 3,000 people since last year at this time. And it's not even clear, really, if a billion dollars would cover all their claims. You take a billion dollars, you divide it by 10,000 clients, there could be more. You get $100,000 a client. Arguably, not enough. All right. Melissa, thank you. And now a bit of business about tomorrow morning's 9-11 anniversary ceremony. We are expecting heavy rain, but the city says that event will go on rain or shine. It's being held at Zuccotti Park, just a few blocks from Ground Zero. It officially begins at 8.40 in the morning. And this year, first responders will read the names of the 2,750 victims. And as always, there will be four moments of silence, marking the time each tower was struck and the time each tower fell. And if you're planning to attend the ceremony or if you work in lower Manhattan, the city asks that you take mass transit. Good idea. Also, an umbrella might be a good idea tomorrow. So what is on the minds of New Yorkers six years after that dark day in our city's history? We've conducted an exclusive poll along with Marist College each year since 9-11. And with me now is the director of the poll, Lee Miringoff. Uh, Lee, what are we learning this year? Well, Chuck, on the positive side, you know, people, there's a sense here that the city is back on its feet, but scars remain. Let's take a look at some of these numbers. 59% of New Yorkers think the city is as good or better than it was before the attacks. Some recovery there. Yet 47% feel their lives will never be the same, and 57% still worry the city could be the target of yet another terror attack. A lot of people I talk with say they're frustrated by the slow pace of rebuilding at Ground Zero. What's the poll tell you about that? Well, what we see in these numbers are, you know, people are losing patience with the pace of the rebuilding efforts. 55% think things are moving just too slowly. So clearly more work needs to be done in order to win over the public confidence and trust. And there was a clear sense six years ago that the city's first responders weren't really prepared for the magnitude of that terror attack. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. New Yorkers don't feel the first responders were adequately prepared. 63% percent as we take a look at these numbers think they were not ready to handle the attacks then 39 percent think they're not prepared today to handle a future attack so we see some improvement in the numbers something that still needs to be done feel, yeah most people feel there's there's much more that has to be done absolutely to make the city fully prepared Arthur, absolutely. thank you very much for joining us tonight and uh, you can find all the results of the poll including what new yorkers uh, feel about it about mayor giuliani mayor bloomberg on security and on our website that's all at wnbc.com all right, we're learning tonight about a death threat against Mayor Bloomberg that led to a significant criminal investigation in the last few weeks. For a time, officials feared it might be terror-related, but those concerns were downplayed in recent days. Our Jonathan Neitz picks up the story from there. News Channel 4 has learned security officials have been busy tracking a threat made against Mayor Bloomberg. Investigators tell us the threat was made by one man, a New Yorker who is a convert to Islam and who became known to police when he went to at least one mosque in Brooklyn seeking help in hatching a plot several weeks ago. 
Intelligence officers tracked the man for weeks, and they say they learned he also has a history of mental problems. They say he likely did not have the capability of making good on his threats. But for a time, those guarding the mayor put on notice, and this former Secret Service agent says, given the alleged threat, a large-scale investigation was likely initiated. Especially if there's something credible about it, uh, you go to that person's family, to their uh, jobs, to their uh, references, to their backgrounds. A spokesman for the mayor and police department declined comment. It was back in March, a Rikers Island inmate was charged for allegedly making threats targeting the police commissioner. Law enforcement officials say while this case not um, as serious no, as they first didn't. feared, vigilance is important. By uh, the news reporting on these things, it makes people aware, more aware, more vigilant. When asked about when and if criminal charges might be filed, an NYPD spokesman said the department does not comment on threat investigations. This, as numerous investigators said, the mayor was not at any increased risk at any time. Jonathan Dietz, News Channel 4. Neighbors knew something strange was going on, but nothing like this. Police uncover what they say was a house of prostitution on a quiet suburban street. When we come right back. I'm Rob Morrison. I'm Darlene Rodriguez. Join us tomorrow morning on Today in New York for the latest news from around the tri-state area. Also, remembering the victims of 9-11 six years later, we're live at Ground Zero with a retrospective. Open House NYC is on the web. If you're buying, selling, or just streaming, go to WMEC.com slash open house for hot listings, tours, blogs, and to watch your favorite episodes. Open the door to what's hot right now at WMEC.com slash open house. Did the world's oldest profession find a niche in one of Westchester's nicest neighborhoods? Tonight, a husband and wife are charged with rolling out the welcome mat for paying customers. Westchester reporter Kendra Farn has the story. In New Rochelle's upscale North End, just a few blocks from the high school, David Saperstein says he knew something strange was going on at his neighbor's house. The renters recently moved out. People started doing the hedges, the grass grew very hard. Then they cut the grass, they did the hedges, they neatened up the whole house. Then at night I started to see lights on. Then the heavy drapes went up over every single window. It was New Rochelle Police say where 34-year-old mortgage broker Rob Werner and his wife Heather Mazenga ran a prostitution ring, advertised on the internet as a members-only club for fantasy, role-play, fetishes, and more that touts the, quote, discreet New Rochelle location. Police busted it late Friday night. Two of our officers did go in there undercover and were solicited. Charged with prostitution and practicing massage without a license are 21-year-old Lydia Clanton of the Bronx, 24-year-old Amy Palevsky of White Plains, 23-year-old Denisha Hudson of Ardsley, and 30-year-old Robin Mapes of Middletown. The Warners moved from New Rochelle several years ago to this home in Pleasantville. Today, no one answered the door. The couple will answer to a judge in court tomorrow. In New Rochelle, Kendra Farn, News Channel 4. At this hour, New Jersey police are still searching for a killer who apparently walked away from Ancora Psychiatric Hospital yesterday. The search is centered in Atlantic County. Police say William Enman was allowed to walk the grounds around 2 p.m. Sunday, but he never returned. He confessed to killing his roommate and his roommate's four-year-old son in 1975. Also in New Jersey, more state legislators are in the federal crosshairs, according to our sources, and questions are being raised about those already accused of corruption. New Jersey reporter Brian Thompson has more. Last week's criminal complaints against Passaic Assemblyman Al Steele, as well as Essex colleague Mims Hackett, led to their almost immediate resignations. This, the handwritten note Hackett penned on Friday night. But why not pressure State Senator Sharp James and colleague Wayne Bryant, both indicted in separate corruption cases? Senate has always been more of a club, and uh, so they therefore tend to rally around their own. Assemblyman Bill Baroni, who's running this fall to join that Senate club, is pushing for stronger ethics laws than what passed this summer and argues two indicted senators should not be making laws. I believe that if you're indicted for political corruption, you should be suspended from your job. Senator James and Senator Bryant decided not to seek re-election and obviously within a couple of months are out of office. Senate President Dick Cody and even Governor Corzine argue that difference from the Assemblyman is crucial. The Democrats remember when the GOP controlled the legislature just a few years ago. What we have done compared to what they have done is night and day. And that's a fact, Jack.
Regardless of how this turns out in coming weeks, sources tell us that at least two legislators, and possibly three, face the investigatory wrath of the U.S. attorney immediately following the November election. In Trenton, Brian Thompson, News Channel 4. The cell phone standoff in city schools up next. The move to get around the latest hang-up and let kids stay connected. Coming up at 7.30 on Channel 4, Britney Spears, her disastrous comeback performance. Where we found her at 3 a.m. Who did she fire right before she hit the stage? Was Britney crying right after her performance? Our complete backstage access is just minutes away. Journeyman is brought to you by your local Tri-State BMW Center. This is going to sound crazy. You went back in time. What if you could journey back? Where am I? And change lives. Do you know why you're here? Two people are going to die tonight. Look out! Journeyman premieres Monday, September 24th on NBC. Journeyman on NBC 4HD is brought to you by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Cell phones in school. The Department of Education says they're disruptive, but many parents call them a lifeline to their children. Today, council members squared off against Mayor Bloomberg over this hotly debated topic. And education reporter Caroline Riddell has the story. And children should be able to have their cell phone going to and from school. The city council uh, taking a stand on cell phones in schools today. Members voting to override Mayor Bloomberg's uh, earlier veto. What this bill specifically says is that parents have a right to send their child to and from school with a cell phone and that no one may interfere with that right. Cell phones are banned in city public schools, frustrating many parents. What the mayor has done is to have us worry all day long about whether our kids are getting to school safely and coming home safely. It's important to understand the council can't directly legislate cell phone policy in schools, but council members hope what they've done today will push the city to come up with a plan that gives kids access to their phones for the trips to and from school. All we're saying is let them keep them in their lockers, in their backpacks, turned off, not to be used. Mayor Bloomberg points out kids already have the right to carry cell phones outside school, but he says the ban inside schools won't change. Senator and Hagel wouldn't you know Senator it, when the mayor American was asked about the topic at a press hard, briefing right today, to he was interrupted school, by a ringing changing. phone. Our teachers have a tough enough job, and uh, <laughs> maybe that's a good example of uh, shame on you. Think about that. You really want your child's day interrupted many times? Maybe a story about getting their children the kind of education so that they can share in the great American dream is more important than somebody who says, I've got to be able to talk to my child to find out whether they want fish or beef for dinner. Carol Ann Riddell, News Channel 4. Birthdays, holidays, the first day of school, those have all become very painful milestones for one Long Island couple whose daughter was killed in a boating accident. Well, now they hope to spare others what they've been through by pushing for minimum safety standards on the water. Long Island reporter Carolyn Gussoff has the story. Some grim statistics as we wrap up another boating season. <laughs> Collisions are way up. There were 40 fatalities in New York State last year. Nationwide, more than 700. Most of them occurred when boaters had no training. In much of the country, there are no requirements. New Jersey and Connecticut require a safety course. But in New York, any 18-year-old can operate a boat. We don't want a family to have to go through this. Gina Leinick is lobbying for a nationwide standard. Her 11-year-old daughter, Brianna, was killed two summers ago when their boat collided with another. No one on either boat even knew how to make a distress call. Brianna's law would give the Coast Guard one year to devise mandatory boating safety courses. 50% of those fatalities and accidents could be avoided by simply requiring people to have certain proficiency before they get in a, a vessel. Brianna's uncle describes the waters off Long Island as the Wild West. He says inexperienced, sometimes intoxicated boaters either don't know the rules of boating or ignore them. The heat, the alcohol, the exhaustion from being, you know, on the boat all day, it impairs everything. Congressman Steve Israel hopes to pass a federal boating education law before another season claims more lives. Carolyn Gussoff, News Channel 4. Heavy rain in the forecast when we come back.
We told you at the top of the broadcast there was rain in the forecast for tomorrow, the sixth anniversary of 9-11. Janice is here now with more details on the forecast. Janice. Well, Chuck, unfortunately, a lot of heavy rain may bring some downpours in the morning, right when a lot of the ceremonies are going to be going on. We've been tracking that heavy rain on Next Red 4. It's still about six to eight hours away. It is now spreading into Virginia and parts of Maryland and West Virginia. It's low pressure that's moving along a front, but it will bring some downpours to parts of the area in the morning. Here's a look at the forecast for tonight. Just spot showers tonight, nothing major. Fog developing, though. Temperatures in the 60s. Tomorrow, uh, pockets of isolated heavy rain, maybe even some thunderstorms here and there with temperatures in the 70s. 69 tonight, 72 in the morning. Downpours are likely. And in the afternoon, temperatures in the upper 70s and the showers will taper off. Drier weather expected, though, Chuck, for the rest of this week, at least until Saturday, the next chance for rain. Now back to you. All right, Janice, thank you. And that does it for this, the first edition of New York Nightly News. Access Hollywood's up next. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Tonight, Jay's all new with Brad Garrett, Cirque du Soleil, and headlines. Look at these kids looking under these kilts. <laughs> then Conan's all new with Paul Giamatti and Allison Hannigan. Tonight.